Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone tonight in Jesus' name. I pray it will be a beneficial, profitable time in the presence of the Lord in Jesus' name. And the Lord will perfect everything concerning you. Father, we thank you for asking, Lord, that your spirit will take the word and apply it to every heart tonight and make us better Christians, spiritual Christians, and Christians who are compromising in the practice of your word in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Tonight we come to an important chapter in 1 Corinthians, the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. And we're looking at chapter 5, from verse 1 through to verse 13. Let's start from verse 1. It says, it's commonly reported that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Tonight, as we look at the chapter, we're looking at the chapter from the perspective of the church, God's church, glorious church, gracious church, and a godly church. And the Lord wants us to have the vision of what the church ought to be and what every believer in the church ought to be. If every believer in the church is godly, the church will be godly. If every believer in the church is saved and sanctified, the church will be a safe church, a sanctified church. If every believer in the church is of God in heart, in mind, in life, in perspective, in understanding, in revelation, and the experiences of the grace of God, of the goodness of God in our lives, if every believer is like that, then the whole church will be like that. We know the Lord is coming back, and he's coming back for a glorious church. And if the Lord is going to meet us as a glorious church, then you ought to make up your mind. I ought to make up my mind. I'll be part of that glorious church. But if anyone is a sport, if anyone is a, is a blemish in the church, will not have a glorious church. That's why as you look at this chapter tonight, you're saying, what else can I do? What more can I do? How can I have so much of the grace of God in my life? How can I have more of the strength of the Lord in my life so that I will be the kind of member the kind of child and the kind of sage I ought to be so that if everybody will be like that, will have God's own church as a glorious church, as a glorified church, and as a pure church. Let's look at verse 7. In verse 7, it tells us what we have to do and what we need to pursue so that the church of the living God will be what it ought to be. It says, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven is the commandment to the minister. Purge out is the commandment to the minister, to the members of the church. Purge out is a, a commandment to every section of the church that as she wants the church to be the church of God, a glorified church, a gracious church, a purified church, a church getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Here is the commandment given to everyone. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye as individuals, ye as families, that ye as the whole church of the, of the Corinthian church and of the church, deeper life church in particular, now that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ a Passover is sacrificed for us. And then he tells us in verse 8, it says in verse 8, therefore let us keep 
the fees. Therefore, let us, apostles and the members of the church, ministers and members of the church, pastors and the people on the pew there, everyone, leadership and the followers, let us keep the fees, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. As we do that, and when we do that, and we continue to do that, the church will be a gracious church. The church will be a godly church. The church will be a glorious church getting ready and getting prepared for the coming of the Lord. And I pray that the grace of God will so saturate everyone's life in our church that we will be the kind of church that Christ sacrificed on the cross of Calvary will be satisfied that we have made use of everything he offered for the church to be the church. And I pray you will have a part in this, I will have a part in this, and when the rapture will take place, none of us will be found missing in Jesus' name. Tonight, we're looking at the message, purging and preserving the church from the world's corruption. You understand that? Purging and preserving the church from the corruption coming from the world. In the way it's seen, the world is trying to get into the church. The activities of the world, the pollution of the world, the corruption of the world, the lifestyle of the world is trying to get into the church. The implication of that is the world is controlled by the God of this world. The world is controlled by Satan. If the world gets into the church, then through that, Satan will have a way in the church. Satan will not have a way in our church in Jesus' name. And Satan will not erode into your life. And Satan will not get into your family. The corruption and the pollution and the practices of the world coming through Satan will not have a place in our church in Jesus' name. But as we study, we need to find out, we need to examine, and we need to look at everywhere critically so that if any pollution is there, if any corruption is there, if the stain of the world, if the defilement of the world is entering into any life, it's your life, or into the life of any member of the church, all of us will rally around and gather together by the grace of God and will make sure that the church is clean, the church is cleansed, the church is purified, the church is purged, and this church and the people of God everywhere will be getting ready for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. I was waiting for a good, good amen. Purging and preserving the church from the world's corruption. Three things we're looking at as we look at the whole chapter. Number one, preserving Christ-like living in his glorious church. Understand, whatever verse we read and whatever explanation we give, it is so that the church will be Christ-like and everyone will be living that glorious life, that Christ-like life in the church, which is supposed to be glorious. Number two, purging out contagious leaven from a godly church. The word contagious is very important. It spreads like anything. It, when you allow a little crack, a little defilement, a little corruption, and then it begins to spread. It destroys the whole system and destroys the whole church. That's why you want to purge out contagious leaven from a godly church. Number three, putting away corruptive libertines. The people who take a law into their hand 
and the people who feel they are at liberty to do anything, they are at liberty to poison themselves, they are at liberty to defile themselves, they are at liberty to defile even the whole church, they are at liberty to break down and to hack down and to destroy the church that Christ paid for with his own blood. They are liberties and therefore because they are corruptive libertines or want to really punch them out and put them away so we can have a truly gospel church. The Lord will give us the commitment and the courage to do it in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number one now. Point number one, preserving Christ-like living in his glorious church. Preserving. You cannot preserve what you don't have. The beginning then is to make sure that you have salvation. Because how do you preserve salvation when you don't have the salvation? And the next thing is to have sanctification. That you go on your knees, you consecrate yourself to the Lord, you're purified from the heart so that self is gone, our sin is gone, the Adamic nature is dealt with and the old man is dealt with and Christ sits on, this, on the throne of your heart. As a result of that, the salvation you are preserving that salvation, the sanctification. You are preserving that sanctification. Some doctrine comes in how you ought to live. A wife or the husband, the husband or the wife, the parents or the children, the life we ought to live in the family, in a place of work, and in the local church. And we're carrying that salvation everywhere. And we apply the word of God to our lives so that that salvation will remain intact. That's when you have something you know, to preserve. And so if you're still a sinner, the Lord is telling you, come to the Lord and repent of your sin, be born again. It's after that new birth, you have an experience, then you have something precious to preserve. Preserving Christ-like living, that means the might of Christ is there, the word of Christ is there, and the goodness of Christ is there, and the character of Christ is there. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. It is when that new life is there, you have something to preserve. If you don't have the new life, if you don't have the grace that comes with salvation, if you don't have the righteousness that comes with salvation, there's nothing to preserve. But you are saved, you're a new creature, you have righteousness in Christ, and you have the grace of God, then you have something to preserve. And it is that preservation in your life that makes you to preserve your position in the church, your place in the church. If you are not preserving salvation, you cannot preserve your membership in the church or preserve your position in the church or preserve your partnership with the people of God. So understand, the preservation we are talking about is that you preserve something spiritual in your life and then we can preserve the whole church. Point number one, preserving Christ-like living in his glorious church. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one is the report. Number two, the responsibility. Number three, the reason. Number one, the report of grievous sinning in a gifted church. Number two, the responsibility of a glorious servant in God's church. The servant of God the pastor in the church, the local leader in the church has responsibility. And if you cannot carry out the responsibility, there's no point saying that I'm a pastor, I'm a leader, I'm a preacher, I'm this, I'm a servant of God. The servant of God is known not by the title. The servant of God is known not by the position. He is known by the responsibility he carries out. Point number three, the reason for guided separation in a gracious church. How will you and why will you take a rotting egg 
out and throw that rotting egg out. There's a reason for that, to preserve the whole basket of eggs to remain clean and to remain fresh so that that rotting egg will not destroy, will not defile, will not make uh, inedible the rest of the eggs that are in the basket. And so when you put away that ungodly person and the unrepentant person, the one who remains rigid in evil and rigid in defilement, there's a reason for that guided separation in a gracious church. Number one now is the report of grievous sinning in a gifted church. Let's come to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 1. It says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Understand? Fornication is not the only sin that people commit that can take them to hell. Fornication is not the only sin that anybody who is a sinner needs to repent of. Fornication is not the only sin that makes people backslide. He could have said, it's reported commonly among you, the stealing among you. It is reported commonly that there is violence or fighting among you. He could have said, it is reported commonly that there is a fraud or fraudulence or whatever in your midst among you. And so whatever the sin may be, whether it's fornication or whether it's the love of the world or whether it is giving in to violence or whether it is fighting or whether it is divorce and separation scattering the families, whatever it is, the people of the world will be gossiping. They'll be taking the rumors all about other church. They say this their name and they say they're a gracious church, they say they're a godly church, they say they're a gifted church, they say they're a speaking in tongues church, and they say they're a miracle working church, and they say that they are, they are people that have faith and they can move mountain. It's a mountain moving church, but it is reported commonly among them in the world that there's fornication, there's defilement, there is stealing, there is sin of all times and there is disobedience and there is a disunity among them and then it says and such fornication as is not once named among the Gentiles it, it was telling them the report were getting about the church at Corinth and the report we are getting may be about your own local church in your district, in your group, in your state, in your region, is that the character of the people there, they even go beyond the sinfulness of the people of the world. Remember once again, it's not only fornication, that is called sin, all kinds of sin. There are some people that the fraud in their midst is greater, is higher than the fraud even in the world. The corruption in their midst is greater and higher and deeper than the corruption in the world. And then the violence in them or the politics, dirty politics in their midst is greater than the dirty politics in the world. Whatever it is, whether it is fornication or it is corruption or it is defilement whatever the sin may be we should not allow any sin in our midst look at verse 2 it says in verse 2 and ye are puffed up what does that mean they were puffed up because we have the gifts of the spirit they were puffed up because we're speaking in tongues they were puffed up because miracles are happening they were puffed up because all these uh, other things, uh, you know, we have a large congregation who are puffed up, they have good music, they were puffed up because we have good administration. They were not looking at what they ought to look at because of that they were proud. They were proud of the things that will not matter in eternity. Ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Why should they mourn? Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 9. A reason why they should have been mourning. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 
verse 9 it says know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God what's the joy you're speaking in tongues but you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God and you have a large church and you have a, large, a great position an important position in that church in that big church but you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God and you have, you have been prospered you know I prayed and God gave me job and he gave me money and I have this and I have that I have a good uh, wife I have a good husband we have children our children are, are graduating they have this and that and we are put up because of that don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God be not deceived neither fornicators no idolaters and so Paul the apostle wanted them to understand he wants us to understand it's not only fornication if it were only fornication he would have said neither fornicators will inherit the kingdom of God but now he begins to tell them and he's telling us as well neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate and nor abusers of themselves with mankind that means homosexuals man and man uh, living together as if they were husband and wife or woman and woman living together as if they were husband and wife he says abusers of themselves with mankind when we misuse your body you abuse your body and when you go into that kind of carnal relationship sinful relationship if you die in that condition you will not inherit the kingdom of God never mind you're speaking in tongues never mind you have faith to remove mountains never mind that you have understanding of prophecy never mind you have the mysteries of the kingdom but if you are like this it tells us in verse 10 in verse 10 it tells us it says no thieves the people who steal you see there are those who will say you know in our church I've never been been disciplined because I don't commit fornication they think that fornication or adultery is the only sin that said that will take people to hell but now Paul the Apostle says no thieves no covetous no drunkards the people who get drunk and they're into alcohol into wine no revilers look at that the people that will revile those that are good the people who will revile those who are holding on to sound doctrine and every time they hear and know that somebody preaching sound doctrine they say what's that they belittle those who preach the word of God and those who stand for the truth of the word of God it says those revilers will not get to the kingdom of God nor extortioners the people who cheat and the people who oppress others and they find a way of getting what belongs to others unto themselves it says they shall not inherit the kingdom of God that's why he was telling them that although you are a gifted church it tells it tells us they are a gifted church look at first Corinthians chapter 1 we're reading from verse 7 first Corinthians chapter 1 we're reading from verse 7 it says so that he come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ he come behind in no gift and then there is a space there the space there is for your righteousness we're waiting i have the gift and then i have the gifts of the spirit i have the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom i have discerning of spirit and i have the gift of faith i have the gift of working of miracles and the gift of healing and the prophecy and the tongues and interpretation all that that was their concern you come behind in no gift and then as a result of that what i'm waiting for now holiness or no holiness sanctification or no sanctification purity or no purity we're waiting now for the coming of our lord jesus christ that's why paul the apostle had to say but even though you have gifts the gifted church we're hearing reports about you let's come to number two here in number two the responsibility of a godly servant in god's church why does god put servants in the local church after he has given us christ he has given us a calvary he has given us the doctrines he has given us the bible and then we even have books why does he still need to place a servant 
a leader, a preacher, a pastor on the church of the living God. You know, there are people they don't understand the necessity of a pastor in a local church. I have the Bible, yes or no. I have the doctrine, yes or no. I have all the various things, and I have internet, I have radio, I have all those things. I can listen to, you know, the word of God. I have the CD there, I have the DVD there, but he has given us a servant. He knows you can have, he knows you can listen to a CD, he knows you can look at, you know, all the systems, social media, but social media is not going to direct you. It's not going to correct you. It's not going to discipline you. It's not going to question you. And it's not going to put you in place and make you stand. All those things, they're good. But God has given us a servant in the church, in the local church, and in the headquarters church. Not only a servant, a godly servant. What's the responsibility then of a godly servant in God's church? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 3. It says in verse 3, I for I verily as absent in the body, but present in spirit. He was their father. When lunch already he said, you might have 10,000 teachers, but you do not have many fathers because in the gospel I have begotten you. I am your father in the Lord. And so now he said, I'm not always there physically, and yet I'm still your father. You might not see your father in the physical every time. He might not be at home every time. He goes to the place of work, he comes back, he travels and he comes back and therefore he is not present in body but is present in spirit. His heart, if he's a real father, his heart is with the family. His mind is with the family. And he's following everything that is going on, even though he might be absent in body, is present in spirit. I'm judged already. I've evaluated already. I have weighed all the reports I'm hearing about you in the Corinthian church. I've judged already. I've examined it already. I've weighed all the pros and the cons already. I have examined your life and I've aligned it with the word of God, compared it to the word of God as though I were present. I were present with you concerning him that has done this deed. That means then a pastor, even after the church service, you are back at home, your responsibility, you are thinking about the life of the members of the church, you are thinking about the reports you are hearing, you are concerned about every member getting ready and getting prepared for the coming of the Lord, and therefore you are weighing their lifestyle and their actions and everything, the reports you are hearing, you are, you are comparing that with the word of God, so that when you want to come and preach the following week or the following uh, meeting, it's not just you just read the Bible and just preach something that does touch the lives of the people the way they're living a judge already in verse 4 it tells us in verse 4 and it says in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when ye are gathered together look at this and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ it says when you come together don't just carry on service as usual, meeting as usual. I'll be gathered there with you in spirit. And the Lord Jesus Christ will be gathered with you there, even though you cannot see him physically. You should imagine, you should visualize that Jesus Christ as the faithful one and the amen and the truth. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name there, I will be in the midst of them understand he watches everything he sees everything he hears everything he evaluates everything you are gathered together the lord jesus christ is there 
and my spirit is there you will imagine that the, your pastor is there you will imagine that your father in the lord is there because actually his spirit is there because actually his mind his love his affection his attention is there and so paul the apostle said i have a responsibility over the church at Corinth, even though I'm not always there in the physical, yet I know I have a responsibility. And that's what he wants us to think about. He wants us to think about the life of the church. He wants us to think about the spirituality in the church. He wants us to think about the uncompromising stand of maintaining the standard in the church we have a responsibility it tells us in second corinthians chapter 13 verse 2 in second corinthians chapter 13 reading there from verse 2 as it talks about the responsibility that the minister has that the pastor has i told you before and foretell you as I, as if i were present he says i'm telling you like I told you before, he wasn't present there in the physical, but he says, as if I were present. The same thing, you know, parents can tell their children, children, you go to school, I'm not there with you, my mind is with you. I'm praying for you every time. I'm thinking about you, and I want your life to shine forth and not to copy all the other children. Remember the home you are coming from, and remember the things you have learned, and remember the prayer, and remember the consecration, and remember everything were put in place. My mind is there. And everywhere you go, walk and live and talk and then interact as if I were present. And the same thing, you know, a minister, a pastor that has the a good of the membership in heart and that has uh, the progress of the membership at heart is living every time. It might be in his house, it might be studying, it might be praying, it might be doing whatever. He knows that he has responsibility over the church of God and then he's talking to them, he's writing to them, he's sending to them as if I were present. The second time I'm being absent now, I write. I'm being absent now, I correct. I'm being absent now, I counsel. I'm being absent now, I purge. I'm being absent now, I give directives, I give direction. Even though you are absent, even though you are not there physically, that doesn't mean I don't have any ministry now because I'm waiting till Sunday. I'm waiting till the meeting time. And when we get to the meeting time, I will do what I need to do. Being absent now, I write. Being absent now, I counsel. Being absent now, I correct. Being absent now, I still send the word unto you to prepare you for the coming of the Lord. And I write to them which uh, which are heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again when I become physically present with you I will not spare I will not spare you it tells us what the responsibility of a real pastor is who is an overseer who is having oversight, who is watching over the souls of the people because he knows he's going to give an account. Let's come to number three now. Number three, the reason for guided separation in a, glory, in a gracious church. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, now he gives a directive, he says to deliver such and one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Underline that, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul the Apostle was uh, teaching the Corinthian believers and he's teaching us, he wants us to understand uh, that we are body, soul, and spirit. We're spirit, soul, and body. 
most of the time we're conscious of our body if you if you strike your hand or something you feel the pain that's your body and if you uh, go into a place where there's smoke you feel the watering in your eyes that's your body and if you step on a sharp stone you feel the pain in your feet that's your that's your body and if you take something that you shouldn't have taken and it doesn't go well with your body you feel the pain inside your stomach that's your body because of that, many people are not conscious of their soul. Many people are not conscious of their spirit. You cannot contact God with your body. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot, um, you know, see God with your physical eyes. That's your body. But it's the, your spirit, the inner man that sees God now. The body only carries your uh, spirit. Your, your body only carries your soul. And it's carrying your spirit and your soul until the day of death. When you die, the body will go to the grave. And then your soul and your spirit will go to God where it came from. And Paul the Apostle is saying, your spirit is very important. Your inner man is very important. The other part of you that will go to heaven is very important. But you see your body that is uh, physical, that we can see, that's not as important. He said, now, look at it this way. The body, when the body feels pain, then your spirit will feel sorrowful. Your spirit will feel the suffering to help the better part of you, which is your soul, to help the better part of you, which is your spirit. Let's drive out that man, drive out that backslider, drive out that corrupter, so that the devil will punish his body. Then he will feel the pain in his body. Because he feels the pain in his body, that will then bring advantage and profit, repentance to the soul and to the spirit. So Paul the Apostle is not doing anything wicked. He's not praying for the death of the man. He's not praying that the man will be totally trampled on by the devil. But it is so that his soul will be saved, his spirit will be saved on the day of the Lord. Look at it right now so you can understand. To deliver such an one unto Satan. All the apostles is saying, I'm an apostle, I cannot come there as the apostle, and then I take a whip in my hand, and I say, I'm going to give you seven stroke of the kid. He cannot do that. He's not a village headmaster. He cannot, the local pastor and the other ministers there cannot say, this man, look at what he has done. And therefore, we have a kangaroo court over here. And the kangaroo court says, he must be beaten. Therefore, uh, you put his face to the wall and then you beat him. So we cannot do that, but Satan can do that. And give him a real smacking and give him real weeping that he will feel the pain for the destruction of the flesh and then he will wake up he'll say what have i done why did i do that look at the way i'm suffering now then he will go to god in prayer and he will repent and he will come to the lord you remember the prodigal son the prodigal son went to the far country and he was enjoying himself and he wasted all the substance with all that was there without us living. He didn't feel anything. He didn't feel any compulsion. He didn't feel any conviction. But the money finished. But there was no food. And the hunger, the hunger that was biting him in his stomach, that's his body. And when that hunger beat him in his body, then he woke up and said, why am I here? What am I doing here? I will go back to my father and I will confess and I will say, that's how the spirit eventually will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I'm sure you remember Jonah. Jonah took the sheep and went the other direction that the Lord had told him. He didn't go to Nineveh. And then, eventually, you know the story, he was thrown into the sea. And when the whale then carried him to the depths of the sea, 
then all those things the weed and everything all around him and then he suffered and they couldn't breathe very well things were terrible and he said he said lord i remember please forgive me whatever you want me to do i will do that is the body being tormented and being oppressed by the devil by satan and then that led him to pray and the lord said to the to the will to vomit him on the shore so the discipline the rebuke and the correction is to make the person suffer physically or suffer shame so that that will lead him to repentance and that will get him back to the Lord. When somebody is under discipline, because he needs to recollect himself and he needs to check up his life and do the right thing if you are going to him and say don't mind everything is all right and you don't want him to feel any discomfort any shame any affliction any suffering you say we still have to keep fellowship with him but he's living in sin. He will not feel the death of the corruption and the evil that he has done. But when you are praying for him, oh Lord, let this discipline turn him around. Let this chastisement turn him around. Let him feel the pain in the physical. Let him feel the pain of the lack of fellowship. Then, when he feels that, he will pray, he will return back to the Lord. I pray God will help us so that when people are in any particular situation, we will not be the people that hinders their repentance and their reconciliation with God and their restoration in Jesus' name. Let me hear your good day. Amen. Amen. Point number two now is purging out contagious leaven from a godly church, purging out a contagious leaven from a godly church. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 6. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lamb? It says, uh, you Corinthian church, the way you glory, you still go about. Yes, we know about that fornication, but it's just one man out of many people. And we know about that fraud, but you know, it's just uh, one. Um, one businessman among uh, many of our members and we know about that wrong marriage but what are we saying is just uh, one person out of thousands of people yes we know about that covetousness and that lifestyle yes we know about the worldliness in that person in that family but it's just uh, one person out of many people that's why Paul the Apostle said Corinthian Christians Corinthian believers your glory is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lamb? And then he says in verse 7, in verse 7 he says, Purge out therefore. That's what therefore means because of the danger of a little leaven and because of the corrupting uh, effect of a little leaven and because that little thing can spread and spread and spread and corrupt everything everywhere because of that purge out the old leaven that she may be a new lamb a new creature that she may have a new life that she may have a new appearance that she may have a new manner of looking at things that she may be a new love as she are unleavened for even christ a passover is sacrificed for us in verse 8 it tells us in verse 8 therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You'll see what Paul the Apostle was saying to the Corinthian church. He put great value on repentance before restoration. You see, there are times when somebody has committed sin and he has committed sin and therefore before the church even disciplined uh, that person, he said, I won't allow them to say I'm under discipline. I won't allow that to happen. And so he goes out. And as he goes out now, although he, did, he committed sin, although he did evil, because
because he's out now, he becomes a hero. And people are asking him, why do you leave? What's happened? Uh, why are you not here? And then he says, well, I want to be there if, uh, you know, they will accept me. I want to be there if this and that. And everybody is saying, they are pleading, please come, please come, please come. They make him to forget his past life. They make him to forget the thing that he did that made him himself to run away. And then when he's coming back, he's not coming back like a prodigal son, like a prodigal daughter. He's coming back like a hero. And he's saying, yes, here I am now. And nobody wants to talk about what happened, about what he ought to repent of, because everybody is saying, come, come, come. And they do not understand Coming to church does not get you to heaven. And coming to be part of the fellowship does not get you to heaven. In your heart, in your mind, in the depth of your heart, you must remember your standing with God. If you're not standing with God and people just make you a hero and then you come back and there's no repentance and there's no regeneration and there's no righteousness and there's no restitution, you might be there and everybody will say, welcome, welcome, we so much appreciate you. But you know in your heart that after you ran away, all the things you did when you were away, you even did worse things than the thing that made you to run away. And there's no repentance about that. Without that repentance, and you're not poaching out the old lemon, you're not settling your life, you're just saying, I'm back, I'm back. That will not do. That's why Paul the Apostle is saying, he says, therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the living bread of sincerity and truth. I pray God will give the whole church understanding in this matter in Jesus' name. Look at three things here. Number one, preventing the polluting spread of a little leaven. A little leaven that can corrupt everything. And number two, partaking of the Passover sacrifice of our liberating lamb. Behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. is the one that liberates us and is a Passover lamb. I want to partake of him, partake of his sacrifice, partake of his salvation, partake of his sanctification, partake of his sufficiency, and partake of everything he offers for us, partaking of the Passover sacrifice of our liberating lamb. Number three is preserving the pure standard of his lofty life. Preserving the pure standard of his lofty life. Look at number one here, preventing the polluting spread of a little leaven. Now, if you, if you understand this, take a little pebble in your hand and throw it to a river. When you throw it to a river, as it gets to that river, you see the ripples going on, spreading and spreading and widening and widening. That's the effect of a little thing that is done, as somebody has done a little, what he calls a little thing, is a mistake, it's a fault, and it's, uh, you know, it's a pitfall, it's my weakness, or whatever it is, that little thing is like that little pebble you throw in the sea and the ripples go on. The same thing in the lives of many people, a little leaven, if you excuse that, a, li a little leaven, if you permit that, a little leaven, if you nurse that, a little leaven, if you protect that, it's going to affect many, many, many other people. It may even affect people that you don't know, and people that do not know you. You have done the evil, you have dropped the defining thing there, and other people feel that is a standard, and that little thing goes on and on. I pray that will not happen in our lives. And look at this in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 7. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 7 is still talking about that. He said, Ye did run well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth. 
he did run well in the past. You know, he, you avoided those little, little things, and you avoided the little leaven, and you avoided all those things that people excuse in other churches, in other denominations, to say, no, I will not do that. I commit myself, I consecrate myself to walking with the Lord, and whatever Christ will not do, I will not do. He did run well in the past now. Who has hindered you that he should not obey the whole truth and the full truth and the entire truth and the complete truth. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. The people who are persuading you do that. You know, that's, that's not uh, very serious. If it comes to the hearing of the leadership, trust us, we'll defend you. Trust us, will protect you. Will not allow the leadership to, you know, to touch you or to do anything. Those are people that encourage those little, little leaven and the people that encourage little misbehavior, little disobedience and little rebellion. And they are promising the people that have the little leaven in their life, the little lost in their life and the little misbehavior in their lives. And they are promising them, don't worry, we'll defend you will protect you and will, will twist the hand of the pastor of the of the leader that he will distract his attention he will not even be able to look at the little thing you are doing that persuasion cometh not of him that call it you then in verse 9 it says in verse 9 a little leaven leaveness the whole love it will spoil the whole thing the whole ministry and the whole and the whole church that's why it's telling us we need to prevent that polluting spread of the little leaven look at number two here number two is partaking of the passover sacrifice of a liberating lamb. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, a Passover, is sacrificed for us. Let me remind you. In the Old Testament, that's in Exodus chapter 12, the children of Israel had been in captivity in the Egyptian bondage for hundreds of years. And now they were going to be delivered. And the Lord said, you'll take a lamb. And that lamb must be perfect and pure and spotless. And then you will kill that lamb and you will apply the blood on the lintels of the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, tell me the rest. I will pass over you. But before that blood of the Passover lamb can be effective, efficacious for you, you will search your house. If there is any leaven in any way, you will take all the leaven and you push them out of your houses. If any leaven is there, the blood will not avail for you. And that's the same thing Paul the Apostle is telling us and telling the Corinthian believers, Purge out therefore the old leaven. You see, there are people, they come to the Lord and they say, Lord, I believe you died for me. I believe you died on the cross of Calvary. I believe you provided salvation for me. They are not purging out the old leaven. They are backsliding. They are not correcting that. They are fornication. They are not repenting of that. They are adultery. They are not repenting of that. And all the stealing, they are not repenting of that. All their lies and deception, they are not repenting of that. They are just saying, Jesus, I praise you. Jesus, I honor you. You are the exalted Savior and you are the Redeemer. And your blood will cleanse me. Everything will be all right. I know Jesus. I believe in you. You are going to take me to heaven. Purge out first. Purge out as the priority. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. You cannot keep the leaven there. You cannot keep the morality there. You cannot keep the compromise there. And you cannot keep all those forbidding objects there and say, I just want Christ, the Passover lamb, that is sacrificed for me to avail for me. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that she may be a new love as ye are unleavened. And then when they 
is no leaven there anymore, no corruption there anymore, no defilement there anymore, and no guilt there anymore, that you are covering something, you are hiding something, you are concealing something. You know? And when somebody comes to your house and comes to your apartment, you carefully and you cleverly cover up something so that they will not see and they say brother brother sister sister and when your phone you keep your phone very well and you put a pin number there so that your wife will not see the picture that is inside there so that your husband cannot see all the pornography that is inside there you cover up all that pornography and you cover up all that leaven and say jesus my savior jesus Jesus, my sanctifier. It's all lie. It's not, that's not going to get you to heaven. Put out, therefore, the old leaven, that she may be a new love as she are on leaven. For even Christ, after purging out the old leaven, Christ a Passover is sacrificed for us. And let's come now to uh, number three. Number three here is preserving the pure standard of his lofty life. If Christ has died for us and Christ has shown us the perfect example how we ought to live and the lofty standard, the high standard of the gospel we ought to maintain, is telling us after you have put out the old leaven, you are not going back to that thing again and you are not searching for the thing again. Now I've got salvation, now I've got sanctification, now I've got restoration. Now the discipline has been lifted. I'm now part of the people of God and they have embraced me. They have accepted me. After they have accepted you, you must make sure that you preserve the pure standard of his lofty life. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 8, it tells us, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not of the old leaven, the old thing that we did that made us to be cast out, the old thing that we did that made us to be separated from the people of God, the old thing that we did that made us to backslide, now that we have come back to the Lord, keep away from that old leaven, neither was the leaven of malice and wickedness. When I was under discipline, that one did not, uh, did not visit me. When I was under discipline, that person did not, uh, you know, get in touch with me. And now I come back. As I come back now, I look at all those people. And that one, I will not greet that one. That one, I will not fellowship with that one. That one, I will not do this. You are not restored yet. You only thought you are restored because you are in a position and you are in a place. Your heart is still not right. If you are really restored, there will be no malice there. If you are really restored, there will be no wickedness now. And now that I come back, I'm going to show them all those people that think they're in authority and they think they can discipline somebody, I will show them pepper. You're still a sinner. You're still a backslider. When you are fully restored and you are cleansed and your life is turned around and changed, malice will not be there, vengeance will not be there, revenge will not be there, any bad character, any bad attitude will not be there. You will not be campaigning among the people of God saying, are you for me or you are for them? Are you for me or you are for the pastor? Are you for me or you are for this person? You will not be like that. All wickedness is gone. It says, but let us keep the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Of sincerity and truth. Your life will be transparent and your life will be holy. You will be above reproach. Now you are living carefully and you are living courageously and you are living uncompromisingly on the standard of the word of God. It tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 22. It says, seeing ye have purified your souls, it's you that will do it. A person who disciplined you cannot do that for you. 
we cannot save you, we can just correct you, we can counsel you, and we can say, because this is not right, step aside and correct this and correct that. That's all we can do. But you are the one that will go back to Calvary. You are the one that will change the efficacy and the effectiveness of the blood of Jesus and be totally cleansing. Ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love, unpretending love, transparent love, wholehearted love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Your love is not lost. Your love is not tending towards fornication or immorality. Your love is now coming from a pure heart, and you do that fervently. In verse 23, it says in verse 23, being born again, born again. Now that, you know, the leaven is gone, defilement is gone, all the pollution is gone, all the corruption is gone, and the blood of Jesus has washed you and cleansed you and purified you. you are born again the spirit of god is bearing witness you are now a child of god the leaven that was there before is no more there there is a cleansing in there and you are clear you're clear and there is nothing between you and god that hinders your fellowship with god you say father then the father answers my son my daughter the road is totally clear between you being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. I pray that this kind of experience will be in every one of us and for every one of us in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. amen. Point number three now. In point number three, putting away corruptive libertines from Truly gospel churches, putting away. You see, if we have the privilege of bringing in, we also have to have the power and the possibility of pushing out. There are people, they only know how to bring in, they don't know how to send out. It's like you have a family. And then you have the children. Anytime you go to work, uh, those little children, you cannot send them to kin the kindergarten yet. And so you need somebody to take care of them. And that's, that's right, that's okay. And then you go to the village. When you get to the village, you say you're looking for somebody. You've not been in the village for a long time. And somebody having familiar spirit, somebody having mammy spirit, somebody having this or that. And the villagers don't think anything serious about that what he said this one is a hard-working lady this one is a hard-working girl and uh, you know will take care of uh, your children and you bring that lady and then you teach the lady how what not to wear how to tie scarf and all that but all the tie scarf will not remove the familiar spirit and now you brought her in to your family and now you hand over your children to do to that hey, lady you go to work and when you go to work, that lady has her own agenda. She wants to win them for her master, the devil. And so she'll be teaching them, do you like to fly without aeroplane? Do you like to go to some meetings where you will eat and everything will be wonderful? And the children, they don't know nothing because this is now they call her sister, they call her auntie, they call her whatever name they call her. And then she begins to pass something across to them. And when you come back home, when you wake up in the morning, your little girl says, Mama, something happened in the night. We're flying and we're, we're flying to that place and to that place. And we were there, we ate, you know, a kind of a rice had never eaten before we ate it was sweet tonight we're going again how did you go to such a place what happened is uh, you know so and so they point to the person you brought in 
and then you say you need that you are praying you are praying you are praying you don't know how to cast out you don't know how to push out you don't know how to send away that person there are people that know how to bring in they don't know how to cast out if you are a pastor if you are a preacher and you are a leader you must know the people that are corrupting the church the people that are polluting the church and the people that are bringing in evil into the church and you need to know how to put away the corruptive liberties from truly gospel churches look at three things here number one is the command to separate from the pollution of contaminants and number two is the commitment to submit to the precept of Christ and number three the concern of saints for the purity of his church let's look at number one number one is the command to separate from the pollution of contaminants look at uh, first Corinthians chapter 5 uh, reading from verse 9 I wrote unto you in an epistle not to accompany with fornicators don't company with them don't befriend them don't interact with them don't allow their character their evil their loss to spill on on you and then in verse 10 in verse 10 it says yet not all together were the fornicators of this world what it means is don't resign from your place of work because uh, co-workers are fornicators. Don't uh, resign from, don't uh, leave school because some of those students in your class, they are fornicators. That's what it means there. It says, yet not altogether were the fornicators of this world or were the covetous or extortioner or the idolaters for then must seek needs uh, go out of the world. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, but now I have written unto you, not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a reeler or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one known not to eat. You cut off relationship, you cut off intimacy, you cut off association from such a person that will pollute you. Now, let us uh, understand uh, you are a father in the family. And you say, I'm a child of God, I'm an adult, I'm matured. No, the character of no one on earth, nobody can influence me to do evil. You have a wife and you have tender children. And this person you are befriending, he comes to the house. As he comes to the house, his, his language is terrible. It's the pollution coming out of his mouth is terrible. The language coming out of his mouth is terrible. The jokes and the gesting and the things he says and the illustrations he gives, you say, I know, but you know, I'm an adult, he cannot influence me, but he will influence your children, but he will influence your family, but he will spoil your Christian faith and your Christian testimony. That's why you must be vigilant and you must understand that you have the commandment to separate from the pollution of contaminants and you'll not allow them to contaminate your family and then the same thing in the church somebody says you know i'm a pastor and even though i have all those ministers and they get near me no problem i've been preaching now for 10 years or for 20 years and no matter what they say and no matter their lives we are just for fellowship they cannot influence me but they can influence your congregation. The congregation will say, if a pastor who knows the right thing and the word of God and sound doctrine, if he's in fellowship with this person, I would even hand over his pulpit to that person, then we're going to follow. And then you destroy the church. You were commanded to separate from anything that will pollute the church of God or your family or our lifestyle. And God will give us the grace and the strength to be obedient obedient to that commandment in Jesus name did I hear an amen from deeper life let's look at number two now number two is the commitment to submit to the precept of Christ the commitment to submit to the precept 
of Christ. And let us look at First Corinthians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? We cannot go out and judge the people on the street. We cannot go out and judge the people and correct the people. I cannot leave this uh, pulpit now and then go to another denomination, another church. Even if they invite me to preach there, even if I agree to go and preach there, I cannot say, okay, after my preaching now, you, uh, you are not an usher anymore. You, you are not a singer anymore. I see this, I see it. I cannot do that because they are not within my authority, under my authority. That's what it means. What have I to do to judge them that are outside? Do not ye judge them that are within. You cannot control another person's wife, another person's children, another person's family, but your own family. If things are not going right, you have the right, you have the responsibility, you have the commandment that you correct members of your own family. And thank God those of us who are here, father and children, this is the family of God. If I see anything that will hinder you from getting to heaven, because I want you to get to heaven, and you must get to heaven. I will say, my son, we cannot do this because this will hinder you from getting to heaven. My daughter, you cannot do that. This will hinder you from getting to heaven. And because you know I say that in love, and I say that wanting the very best for you, you will say, yes, I understand. Then you get on your knees and you correct all those things. And by the grace of God, with counsel, with correction, with response, and with uh, proper responsibility, and we're in relating together as teacher and student, we're relating together as father and children, we're relating together as a pilot and passenger to get us and drive us all to heaven. By the grace of God on that final day, we'll make it together in Jesus' name. As I get into the kingdom, I look to my right, I look to my left, I look around, I say, praise the Lord, you are there. Where are you? I say, praise the Lord, you are there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. That's a commitment, a commitment to submit to the precept of Christ that says, here is what you do. We judge what is inside. We correct what is inside. We put right what is wrong. Look at number three here. Number three is the concern of saints for the purity of his church. The concern of saints for the purity of his church. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. This is the goal, this is the dream, and this is the expectation that the whole church will be the sanctified church in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Remember, that's a calling. Remember, that's a consecration. Remember, that is a commitment that the church of God, with all its membership, will be saints, called to be saints and sanctified it tells us in ephesians chapter 5 ephesians chapter 5 verse 3 in ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 3 it tells us about what the church should be it said but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let each not be once named among you as become a saints Temptation might come, then you remember, I'm a child of God, I'm a saint of God, I'm a son of God, I'm a daughter of God, I'm the bride of Christ waiting for the time of the rapture. And when the Lord will come anytime, morning, noon, or night, I will be ready. Fornication must not be once named in your life. 
uncleanness must not be once named in your life. Pornography must not be once named in your life. And any sin that is evil, any sin that is unrighteous, any sin that is polluting, any sin that is corrupting, must not be once named among you. As you have given your life to the Lord and the blood of Jesus has cleansed you and the blood of Jesus has washed you whiter than snow and you want to continue in that relationship with the Lord, in that fellowship with the Lord, and you want to be ready by the time the Lord will come. You want to make sure that any form of sin, any shape of sin, any size of sin, fornication, any form of un ungodliness, any form of uncleanness or covetousness must not be once named among you as it becomes sins. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. The Lord loves us. And because He wants us to be ready for the rapture, He wants us to be gracious. He wants us to have the fullness of the grace of God. He wants us to be glorious. He wants us to have the glory of what He has purchased and the life that He laid for us as a perfect example. And He wants us to be ready for the coming of the Lord. He says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. He let heaven to come to the earth. He let the glory of heaven to come to all the, all the shame and all the suffering and all the crucifixion and all the betrayal that he experienced in this life. He gave himself. He gave himself so you can be saved. He gave himself so you can be sanctified. He gave himself so that you can be purged and you can be presented in the sight of the Lord without blemish and without any evil. And then he tells us, in verse 26 the reason why he gave himself that he might sanctify that he might purify that he might purge that he might cleanse that the blood of jesus might take away every stain and every spot and every defilement and every corruption and every leaven that might wash everything away cleanse everything away that he might sanctify and cleanse it of the washing of water by the word what's the purpose for that look at verse 27 in verse 27 that he might present it to him what kind of church? I said, what kind of church? Every local church should be a glorious church. And then our church all together should be a glorious church. And you must be a glorious Christian. When you have a glorious brother there, a glorious sister there, a glorious brother there, a glorious boy there, a glorious daughter there. And when all the members of the church in your heart glorious, in your mind glorious, in your Christian experience glorious, in your appreciation of the word of God glorious, and in your demonstration, the life you live glorious when every believer when every christian when every member of the church has that glorious life from the heart to the inner man to the spirit to the soul to your thinking and to your action and to your behavior everything that you do when that glory of god is reflected because of the cleansing of the blood of the lamb that's when the whole church will be glorious that's why jesus gave himself that's why he gave that sacrifice that will be saved that will be sanctified that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy you will be holy all of us will be holy in jesus name that's a sanctification experience he wants to present to himself when he comes back when he comes for the church and the dead in christ will rise and then we which are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds he wants us to be holy and without blemish and I pray the Lord will do it in your life, in my life, in all our lives, in Jesus' name. We're reading from, we're reading from Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking at verse 14. It says, for no peace with all men, with how many people? How many people are you going to be fighting with? I said, how many people will you fight with? Nobody, because you are going to be at peace with all men. 
at peace with your wife at peace with your husband at peace with your neighbors at peace everywhere you go follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord he wants us sanctified he wants us purified and he wants us to be part of that glorious church that christ is coming for and it's only on that condition anyone will see the lord the position we hold in the church the authority will manifest in the church and the things we do in the church, the activities, all that will not prepare us, will not get us ready for the rapture. If the leaven of uncleanness is there, if the leaven of fornication is there, if the leaven of corruption is there, if the leaven of uh, sinfulness is there, if the Adamic nature is there, if the fighting, the violence, and the dis discord and disunity, if it's there, all the position will not get us ready for the kingdom. It is the purity of heart and the purity of life and that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord that will get us there. That's why Jesus himself told us in Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 Matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 8 it says blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. I pray you'll see God on the final day. I said you'll see God on the final day was use having position in the church and then on the final day when the Lord comes you are not able to see the Lord what's the use you have power you have position you have authority and you have activity you have whatever it is and you have you have amassed all the things of this world and then when the Lord comes to take his people home to heaven you are nowhere to be found you'll be of all men of all women of all church goers the most miserable but when you're saved when you are sanctified and when the Lord purifies your heart and it gets you ready for the kingdom of God and you have the blessedness of the pure in heart and there you see the Lord on the final day then you'll be happy that you overcame all those temptations you'll be happy you overcame all the corruption you'll be happy you stood firm in the things of the Lord until the coming of the Lord I pray all the grace you need all the strength you need all the power you need to be ready for the coming of the lord the lord will put into your life in jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the lord in prayer and say lord i want to be ready lord i want to be ready lord i want to be ready if there's any leaven purge it out any fornication there purge it out any adultery there purge it out any uncleanness there purge it out any pornography there purge it out and any kind of a fraud there purge it out and make sure that your life is according to the word of god let the blood of jesus cleanse you let the blood of jesus purge you you remember, you must take it with the leaven before you can say, I trust in the Passover sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance falls before restoration. Repentance falls before regeneration. Repentance falls before you can have the righteousness that prepares you for the coming of the Lord. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let him do what needs to be done before you leave the church today.